Welcome to the Presbyterian Church in Caddis, Ohio. We believe the Presbyterian Church of Caddis exists to share our faith in Jesus Christ with family, friends, and neighbors through our outreach and mission, worship and spirituality, fellowship, and communication. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to worship here at the Presbyterian Church of Caddis, where we have been serving the Caddis community with the love of Christ for over 200 years. How about that? Speaking of our celebration, these were on the table last week. If you didn't take one home with you, there is a box of them downstairs where the peanut butter is as you leave the building. Um, take one with you. You're welcome to them. And um, peanut butter will be picked up and shipped away on Friday. So if you brought peanut butter, thank you. If not, try to bring it in this week and we'll make sure it gets to where it's supposed to be. Okay? Uh, what else is happening this week? Deacons are going to meet where? In the Hudson Room? Deacons are going to meet in the newly ordained Hudson Room. Um, right after worship and then they're not going to be long because Taya and I are going to be in there right after you right no sleeping on the couches during confirmation um, tomorrow we are starting the disciple Bible study so anybody who is interested in learning more about the Bible this is the way to do it we're going to start at 645 the class will run until 8 o'clock in in two 12-week sessions you will run through the entire Bible and study the whole thing. So if you're interested in that, please come tomorrow. Um, it does ask for a commitment that you actually show up to the classes and you actually spend at least an hour a week doing some homework. Um, but I think you'll find it's well worth, worth, it's worth, worth your while once you do. Um, book club is meeting Tuesday afternoon and the book is A Man Called Ove. And it's a very oddly interesting book. Is that a fair way to say that? Yeah, okay. Um, Friends in Spirit is a new group that wants to go and fellowship together and thought that they might do that by visiting some local eateries and wineries. So if you want to be a part of the Friends in Spirit, I believe they're going to begin their outings at and I've got the name right, the Ohio Valley Winery. Is that what it's called? It's the new winery right across from D'Angelo's. Um, seven o'clock on Wednesday, is that right? Yeah, seven o'clock on Wednesday. Um, and next week, right here at seven o'clock, our own Paul Moore, and friends are in concert at 7 o'clock. When was the last time you were at an organ concert? It's been a while, if ever, because organs and organists and organ music are fading, dying breed, but it's still beautiful. He can make this, this machine sing. <laughs> he can. He, he maybe isn't going to admit to that, but he really can and um, it will be worth your while to be here to hear that. So please come next week at seven. I think that's all the announcements we have. So friends, let us join together in the worship of God. <clears throat>
The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim God's handiwork. The day pronounces God's glory without a sound. The night expounds God's knowledge without a word. And yet their voice goes out through all the earth. Let us join our voices with the voice of creation in declaring God's glory. Let us boldly confess our sin before the one who already knows our errors and is gracious to forgive our hidden faults. Rescuing God, you brought us out of the land of captivity. 
out of the house of slavery. Forgive us when we willingly return to slavery, making divine the machine production, crafting idols from excess of consumption. Forgive us when we consider ourselves so grand that we do not rest and enjoy your presence, defining ourselves by our ability rather than by your love. Forgive us when we esteem ourselves so little that we dare not rest and sit with ourselves, exposed without the cloak of productivity. Forgive us when we dream ourselves so central that we do not rest and halt consumption, decimating earth, denying her Sabbath and integrity. Forgive us, good Christ, who redeems us from the brokenness of slavery, that we might enjoy your presence, creation, and community. Righteousness does not come from our own doing or not doing. Righteousness comes from God by faith. Through the faithfulness of Christ our Lord, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Having been reconciled to God in Jesus Christ, I invite you to share signs of reconciliation and the peace of Christ. In sharing the peace, we express the reconciliation, unity, and love that come only from God, and we open ourselves to the power of God's love to deal with our brokenness and make us agents of that love in the world. Since God in Christ has forgiven us, let us forgive one another. The peace of Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Before John reads, he's going to read the Ten Commandments. But what I want you to do is I want, to take, want you to take your bulletin and flip it over to the back. And take some sort of writing implement. And see if you can write the Ten Commandments. See how many you know. Okay, ready? Go. I'm serious. Anybody get all ten? Don't roll your eyes at me. I'm serious now. Oh, a few more minutes? Okay, sorry. This was not intended to be a group activity. No, I wonder if I should be watching this. 
Seven back there? Uh, wait a minute. St steel. We should have steel. Well, we're yes, making we up a few. <laughs> there are only 12 <laughs> in no other Winner gets a free mug. Uh, <laughs> love, the, love your name. How about it? Did you get 10? Anybody? That's a, we only have seven. This is always an interesting activity because you know there's always, there's this, there's this, this push in our political life to, um, you know, should the Ten Commandments be in our public sphere, you know? Mm -hmm. But yet, when you ask people what are the Ten Commandments, very few people can come up with all ten. So, it's a very interesting kind of exercise to think about. Listen carefully. John will read them. You'll get ten. We'll make every effort at this. <laughs> In the Older Testament reading, the Ten Commandments do come from the book of Exodus in various, cha various uh, uh, verses through the chapter 20. Then God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall, make no, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor male nor female slave, nor ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning and sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks to, God. be to God. The epistle lesson comes from Philippians chapter three. If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ and righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make, not that I have already obtained this or already reached the goal, but I must press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Jesus Christ. The Psalter reading is responsive. It is printed in the bulletin, Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. 
The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clearly from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Matthew 21, 33 through 46 is one of Jesus' parables. Jesus is speaking and he says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. And then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent the slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, and killed another and stoned another. And again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. And finally the landowner sent his son, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard and the other tenants who will give him to other tenants who will give him the produce at the time of harvest. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him. But they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Here ends our reading. Thanks be to God.
I suppose you've heard that Pat Robertson is at it again. Tragedy has beset our nation, and it's somebody's fault. Last time, remember, the hurricanes hit, and it was the gays' fault. Our nation had wandered far from God because we allowed gays to exist in our presence. And so God sent a hurricane, according to the Reverend Roberts. This time, mass shooting, according to him, is the result of us failing to sufficiently respect our president. Now, I have to tell you, that man is a perfectly well-educated human being. He went to Princeton Seminary, a fine institution of higher learning. In his class at Princeton came him, came Lyman Coleman, who is the founder of Serendipity Bible Studies that have brought the word of God to millions of people, and also my former field ed supervisor, all in the same class from Princeton Seminary. Princeton Seminary wouldn't recognize the word that I just brought you from Pat Robertson, because it is, among other things, non-biblical. It is not that the Bible says somehow that we are to be disrespectful or sinful as a nation. In fact, the Bible says just the opposite. But the Bible's concern for the nation, mostly, is that we care for the poor and downtrodden. But the thing the Bible also is very clear about, and it seems so unfair to us, is that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. When it is, for example, your child who runs out into the street and gets run over by a car, and there, somebody says the biblical understanding of that is the rain falls on the just and the unjust, that is not a comforting thought. It is far more comforting to hear a message like, it's those people's fault over there. This is why God is punishing us. But see, the other thing that's not biblical about that is that God is not a punishing God. That's not how God functions. And people say, oh, but in the Old Testament, blah, 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 blah. Let me tell you something about the Old Testament. Yes, there are places in the Old Testament where you can see that God's people were punished by God. But God did not do that capriciously. God punishes God's people in the Older Testament because they have not lived up to the agreement that they had with God. God and the people of Israel were in covenant with one another. And if the people didn't do what they were supposed to, Ultimately, the worst punishment they faced was that they were exiled from the land that was theirs. But guess what? Even though the people don't keep their covenant, God always does. There might be consequences to actions that happen in the Older Testament, but God is always faithful and just, and God always rains down grace upon God's people. The people were exiled for a generation, but God brought them back fuller than they ever were to the land that was once theirs. See, here's the thing. Here is who God really is. 
And I was reminded of it this week. And if I told you who this person was, you all would know who I'm talking about. But I'm not going to do that because I don't have permission to use this person's name in light of her story. But somebody came in this week and she said, I want to give to the Hudson Room because Bill Hudson meant so much to me. And I've heard a lot of these stories, so at this point I kind of go, mm-hmm. Tell me how, tell me your story, tell me what he did for you. And she said, when my child died, when she was in elementary school, none of my friends or family wanted to talk about it. So I would come and Bill would just let me blather on. And she said, the greatest thing that I remember from that time of sitting with him was that he said to me, you know, God is weeping too. She was obsessed with why this had happened to her. Why would God allow this to, to be? Why would a child's life be snuffed out so soon? God weeps with you too. See, there's a wonderful story about a little girl who's with her friend, and her friend falls down and her doll breaks. And the friend had run ahead, but she runs back to her friend. And later on, Dad says, where were you? What happened? And she said, well, I ran back to my friend. And he said, oh, you ran back to help her pick up the pieces of her doll. And she said, no, I ran back to cry with her. I am told, although I don't know, that at the Oklahoma City bombing site, there's a beautiful memorial. And in the place where the children's nursery once was there, there's a statue of Jesus that has the shortest verse in all the Bible. And Jesus wept. Look, they taught me in pastor school that when something bad happens to somebody, I'm supposed to have a clear and sure answer about why that is. Because it is the greatest thing that people wrestle with in their own faith lives. And I am sure that that is true. And the answer I always gave in pastor school, they would always tell me is not sufficient, but it is sufficient for me. And the answer to why bad things happen to good people is I really don't know. I know they do. I know that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And here's, the other, here's two other things that I know about that. One is that God weeps with us when those things happen. God does not intend for us to live with tragedy and pain and hurt. God no more wanted to see people injured and maimed in Las Vegas than anything. But the third thing I know is not only is God weeping at that, but it is not what God intends for us because God is a God of grace and justice, of love and compassion. Scripture says that the Lord works for good for those who love him. Pat Robertson is right about this. The pain that was caused there that day and the pain that often comes to us through tragedy so sometimes comes through our own sinful nature. We mistreat one another. We mistreat our neighbors. I hate to say, but maybe one of the reasons we can't name all the Ten Commandments is because we're afraid of which ones we're breaking. But 
God doesn't act that way toward us. And God doesn't want to see us act that way toward one another. In every step of this Bible, in every action that God has taken, in every action that God still takes to be involved with us in each and every moment and minute and second of our lives, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, God wants only what is best for us. Only for us to know God's grace and love. And to share it with one another. May we pray for peace in our world. Peace in our community. Peace in our families. Peace in our church. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Stand with me now, won't you? Say what we believe as we find it in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our meditation hymn is one you know, but not by this name. The name in the book is, O Lord my God. The name you know is, How Great Thou Art. And our most esteemed organist is not going to let us sing this like it's a dirge, because we're singing praise to God. How great thou art. Let us sing.
Friends, please be seated. As we pray today, we remember our friends um, Bob and Denise Henderson and the passing of Denise's father, Fred Call. Our sympathies to you. Also, please keep Bill Sanders in your prayers. Some of you have asked. Bill has been in the hospital for almost two weeks. He's in Wheeling Hospital. He's having trouble swallowing. They're teaching him how to eat. Um, and uh, last time I was there, I couldn't rouse him to wake him, to let him know that I was there. So, um, But his, one of his nurses is an old friend of mine from Calvary Church in St. Clairsville, and he said, Bill's an ornery patient. And I said, that's not how Bill usually would be. Um, so uh, I think he's not feeling real well still, but um, that's where he's been, in case you're wondering, and he, he needs our prayers. Um, other joys or concerns we have today? Nothing. We'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. Anything else today? Well then, dear ones, let us pray. God, we turn to you knowing how great you are. Knowing that the mere thought of all that you have given and brought to this world and to your creation is awe-inspiring. May we come to a place where we humbly bow before you, offering you praise and thanksgiving for the many gifts which you have showered upon us. And we thank you, O oh Lord, for the glory of your world, for the beauty of creation, the warmth of the sun and the gentleness of the rain. But we pray this day, O oh Lord, for those for whom natural disaster is such a reality. For the people of Houston and South Texas, for those in Louisiana, for the people of Florida, those in Puerto Rico. We know, O oh Lord, that you work for good for us and for the, all those who love you. And we pray that you would surround the people of Las Vegas with your love. We pray for those who mourn. We pray for those who are traumatized. We pray for those who have been injured. We pray your comfort rain down upon them, O oh Lord. And we pray that they might see your grace. God, we ask this day that you be with those who grieve and mourn, and especially that you bless Bob and Denise during this difficult time. We pray your healing love, Lord, be with Bill, that he recover well. We pray for Joanne. And we thank you for healing Seen and Renee. And we pray, O oh Lord, for our community, for the needs here, for the children and youth who need to know you, who need to know that they are loved by you and loved by their families and loved by this church.
We ask your blessing on all those kids, Lord, those who are wildly successful and those who have found trouble in their lives. And we pray that they know you, that they find courage, and that they find safety in your arms, in the arms of their loved ones. Almighty God, you have given us so much. May we truly be thankful as we pray as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So you are aware, next week, we will have a guest preacher here. His name is Mike O'Neill. He is um, a pastor in Texas, and he's coming as a candidate for the position of pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Wheeling. Um, but we will also have a baptism, and that guy ain't getting near that baby. That baby's mine. Harper Grace, who is Renee's granddaughter, will be here to be baptized, guaranteed to make faces that will make you coo, because she is the cutest little thing ever. Um, so come next week prepared for joy as we uh, invite Harper into our midst. Friends, straining forward to see what lies ahead, let us offer ourselves to God. Our morning offering will be received. May these gifts which we offer back to you, O Lord, be used to further the work of your church and your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. When I planned this service today, I didn't really plan to say anything about Las Vegas, but it is a national tragedy, and I thought it appropriate that we end today by singing our national hymn. So our closing hymn is number 331, God of the Ages, Whose Almighty Hand.
blessed ones, as you go from here, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.